It's December 2020, and this is a special edition of Rook. Welcome to a special four-part Rook original series coming to you on all our platforms, SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. You know, it's no secret that devotion to music can affect your life. A favorite artist can end up serving as the soundtrack to your days on earth. So what happens if a larger group of people, say much of the urban population of an entire country, becomes devoted to a rock band? Surely it can have an impact on the fabric of a nation. Pop culture is now the lingua franca of the world. Maybe rock music can be a panacea, an inspiration, an escape, or even a lifeline for a turbulent place. Let me introduce the proposition here because the question is a simple one. What recipe of ingredients formulated the secret sauce that would lead the songs of a classic British rock band to weave their way into the cultural DNA of the Iranian people? How did a complex group of English musicians initially peddling ambient sounds and psychedelia become idols for generations of Persian populations inside an officially designated Islamic Republic? Somewhere in the combination of timing, access, long-form composition, sonic inventions, anti-authority messaging, and philosophical lyrics, Pink Floyd resonated. And it still does. It turns out it's a very Persian predilection. Now, to be sure, Pink Floyd is one of the most beloved rock bands of all time and one of the biggest selling bands ever. That's not a revelation. But for most of the world, they are indeed among a list of others, a list on which you would find, say, the Beatles or the Stones or U2 or the Who or Zeppelin and many others. But there is something deeper at play when it comes to a connective tissue with Iranians. The hypothesis is a simple one, that there was and is a disproportionate connection and affection between the Iranian people emerging out of the 70s, 80s, and 90s and Pink Floyd, more than most elsewhere in the world. And it's a fact that's not so hard to unscientifically determine. Ask most Iranians of a certain age about this group and you'll have your answer. They will nod and you will know that they know they're Floyd. But the more interesting piece is the question that spawns from this finding. Why? Why Pink Floyd? Why this particular Persian preference? And it seems the prescriptions are many in trying to find that answer. So we're embarking on a journey to get that answer. Over the next four parts of this series, we will speak to 15 prominent Iranians from around the world. Musicians, composers, producers, writers, critics, sound engineers, and performers to gain some understanding. On part one, we will look at fandom and context with Ali Azimi, Dara Darai, Ramin Sadiqi, and Roya Arab. On part two, we focus on Sonic's class and connection with Reza Mokadas, Amir Bahari, and Sep Osli. With part three, we will explore drugs, access, and melancholy with Arash Sobhani, Siamak Shirazi, Maral Mohammadi, and Ehsan Sadiq. And with our final part, four, we will look at storytelling classics and conclusions with Logar Ramin Torkian, Anush Sabutakin, Sonos Sotudeh, and Arash Mitui. We hope you will check out all the parts of this series in order, as it's a full story that we're trying to tell. You really don't need to be a Pink Floyd aficionado to come along on this ride and explore the cultural dimensions at play. This series is mostly in English, with some parts in Farsi. It can all be found in one place at our website, rookmedia.com. We hope you'll share it, savor it, side with it, send us your thoughts, and we hope we will have come up with some answers for you by the end of part four. For now, turn up the volume, strap yourself in, immerse yourself in some Floyd. I'm Gian Gomeshi, 
and this is a Rook special, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian Obsession. Let's get started. Here we go. Our first guest on this Rook special series is one of our faves, a Persian alternative rock singer, songwriter, and lyricist. Ali Azimi was born and raised in Tehran. After getting his master's in mechanical engineering in the UK, Ali returned to Iran in 2009 and formed the band Radio Tehran. Leading this new rock band as the vocalist and songwriter, Ali recorded the album 88. It touched on the issues of Iranian youth, and the album gave a fresh sound and perspective within the Iranian alternative music scene. After Radio Tehran disbanded in the early 2010s, Ali went solo and has released three acclaimed albums and a few hit songs and videos. His latest album is called Of Love and Other Evils, and right now, Ali Azimi joins us from London, England today. Hello, sir. Hi, Jajan. Very mamnoon as uh, uh, your kind uh, introduction, as always. Um, I'm always happy to be on your show as well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm the Khaili Mamnoon one. I'm, I'm really happy to have you on the, <laughs> the program. Always good to hear your voice. So so let me start here, Ali. You're Iranian. You're a rock musician. I have my suspicions, but I actually don't really know the answer to this question. I mean, you and I have talked music outside of the show and i know that we're both strokes fans for example but are you actually <laughs> a pink floyd fan a fanatic one <laughs> <laughs> that's the correct answer you you've proved <laughs> you've proved the hypothesis in one in one sentence <laughs> tell me tell me yeah, about uh, how and where you first discovered pink floyd i'm assuming even as a kid in iran oh yes so uh, i was uh kid who grew up in Iran in the time of uh, post-revolution and during the war. So my early uh, years uh, when I was growing up, I was kind of, uh, I don't know, somehow I didn't like Iranian music, uh, Iranian pop music at all. It ne never resonated with me. Um, so, um, I mean, if I set the scene first, well, obviously everyone knows that uh, during those times, early 80s, um, the, the situation in Iran was... Uh, was very unique. Uh, so it was post-revolution. During the war, uh, there, were, there were rations, there were a proper crackdown on music, and the leader of that revolution uh, famously called music haram. And, uh, you know, so we know that story as, as well. So having a cassette of any kind of sort of uh, uh, Western music was, was a crime at the time when I was growing up. So um, in my view, um, the reason why I uh, became a big fan of Pink Floyd was the influence I had from my from my older brother and my older cousins, and the, and the circle they were kind of uh, you know hanging with. So uh, that was the first instant where I was introduced to Pink Floyd, and uh, it was an instant love. Instant crush. Well, so we're going to be asking people throughout this special, throughout these four parts, uh, to give reasons for why they believe Pink Floyd resonated so much. And it occurs to me that you, I mean, you've already done the work here. I, I can ask you in the in the first person, since you were there in the 1980s as a kid, since you are into rock music, since you are a musician. Uh, I accept your point about uh, not being interested in sonati, classical Iranian music, etc. But but why Pink Floyd, which is the name of this uh, special, this series, why was it Pink Floyd for you, as opposed to the Rolling Stones or the Who or the Clash? What was it that made Pink Floyd resonate so much for you? Well, I'm, as, as a very young teenager, like maybe 10 or 9, I started listening to my uh, moms and dads. Uh, there was the cassettes, I would, I would call it... Uh, old songs for some reason from Sher Shirley Bassey to uh, Tom Jones to stuff like that. And it was okay. I was, I was better than our own pop music in my opinion, but 
at the time. But and uh, then I I was introduced to Beatles. That was a big change in my life. That was a huge change, and um, I was so fascinated by by Beatles. Yes. And uh, I mean, gradually I was introduced to other type of music. I was a big fan of uh, the Police for some, because my brother was a fan of the Police. And um, but personally, I mean, somehow Pink Floyd really resonated with me. I mean, I, I was a weird child. I was a I had a I didn't have a very normal childhood um so I, I my taste was also not to my to my age it was different it was uh i couldn't even understand at the beginning most of their lyrics and uh, and i have to kind of i have to say my improvement in my english it was as a young uh kid was actually partially due to my uh in interest in their lyrics so, uh, so i would for, for example no seriously for example you, you, I would, you I would, learned uh, english through pink floyd i, would, I love it yeah. <laughs> i would listen to to an album like final cut which i really love the, their final album and i was thinking who's who the fuck is maggie so i so kind of i learned i mean i improved on my english and also on my on my, on my uh, general knowledge about the world and the and the politics and all that so i realized okay this is margaret thatcher for example and um so yeah uh, for for me personally, I don't know why, but to this day, when I listen to Pink Floyd, I say, "What the fuck? How <laughs> how good these guys are! These guys are amazing." So that's just me. I mean, I, but, I I'm just in love with them. By, big, by, big by the way, by the way, Final Cut was not their final album. You are clearly, unless you're saying that Pink Floyd isn't Pink Floyd after Roger Waters. Of course, I would say that. <laughs> clearly. <laughs> so, so you don't accept the David Gilmore. You, you don't accept no, the later years. Div- Division Bill and whatever came afterwards were, were fantastic. I love them, but they're they're not not comparable. Okay. In do, my you, view. do you remember what it was that was um, so? So you're that kid in the in the '80s and the cassettes being passed down. Was it the Wall? Was it Dark Side of the Moon? What What, what was it that? Do you actually remember the first time you heard Pink Floyd? Mm. Must have Must have been the Wall. Must have been the Wall. Must have been uh, another brick in the wall. I think one of those songs or Hey You. It must have been the Wall because I remember. Uh, in a very early age, I actually watched the movie by Alan, Alan Parker as well, yes. which was uh, not very appropriate for my age. But you know, it was, it was, uh, I, was I was shocked. I was shocked, and um, it must have been the, the first songs that I heard must have been from that album, The Wall. So here's now that here's where we can get into the the thesis or the uh, the hypothesis. Although I think it's been proven at this point, I, I'm going to go ahead and say the thesis of this special, which is that. In fact, you described yourself as an oddball, and well, even as a kid, Pink Floyd uh, was something that I took to. In fact, you weren't an oddball. There were many Iranians, in fact, disproportionately so, Iranians connected with and have this affection for Pink Floyd. So um, now speaking beyond yourself, what is your theory about why Pink Floyd has inserted itself into the Iranian cultural DNA? I, w- I want to uh, uh, mention a couple of points. First of all, um, it's a thing of uh, timing, I think. Um, Pink Floyd came, I mean, in early 60s, and se- I mean, in 60s when Sid Barrett was, was in, in, the, in the game, and then in the 70s they became very famous. And, and you know, uh, that, was, that was right after the revolution in Iran. And if you... Um, I'm not saying that most Iranians understood uh, the uh, philosophical aspects of their lyrics or anti-establishment taste in, in the lyrics, but, but somehow it, it resonated for, with the people of that era. I think it was an incident because, I mean, I always, when I, when I watched the movie uh, Searching for Sugarman, for example, I'm yes. sure you've seen it, right? Of course, I the love it. The yeah. famous documentary. Yeah. Sixto Rodriguez was, uh, was a guy, probably at the same time as Dylan, which never came, never became famous, but in South Africa, it became a you know a huge figure. So I think somebody probably brought Pink Floyd to Iran, or a couple of people brought it to Iran, and 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 with the circles that they had, and you know the people that they were in, they probably spread that, and um, it it grew like a wildfire because of the certain aspects that it had. But the sound that they, it had was was not too harsh, was was not so much against like it wasn't it wasn't heavy metal, for example. Uh, it was so memorable. It was so nice, and it had this kind of a uh, 
the success of the, you know uh, the wall album which made it very popular and and it grew like water tell me about the sound because that it's very interesting to me um th this point about what what kind of sound what kind of musical sound iranians might gravitate towards because when uh, when folks make the argument that well this you know the wall and and the the, the career of pink floyd is about these anti-establishment lyrics and that really appeal to people particularly in the post-revolutionary crackdowns etc i think my answer to that would be well London Calling by The Clash came out in the same year. I mean, yes, The Wall is iconic, but so is London Calling. I mean, the, this was like a defiant, you know, you want anti-authority? It's right there. Three or four years later, U2 puts out an album called War with Sunday Bloody Sunday and with a, a defiant call against authority and crackdowns and the same th sort, sort of thing again. Those albums yes. didn't, cra didn't break through in Iran in the same way. So... What is it about musically, sonically, that uh, Pink Floyd has that those bands don't have, or vice versa? I mean, I've thought about this question long and hard, to be honest. Right? You're right because if you want to, if you want to put your finger on uh, that point, that yes, there were so many other other music, other bands w which were more anti-establishment. I mean, come on, man, the music even to this day is is timeless <laughs> it is it's timeless it, it, it is it's, I, I, th I, th I think they're fantastic and i think it's not it's just i mean i've been to many uh, concerts by roger waters and i saw pink floyd as the as a whole band the four members of the band for a very last time in london by luck when i went to uh live eight f festival oh the the one that. time that they reunited <laughs> you saw that Wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, it, yes. So I, I moved to London from Tehran in 2004 to do my master's in engineering. And somehow, very <laughs> randomly, uh, the heavens worked in my way and I, I won the tickets and I, I won two tickets to, to go and see Live 8. So I made sure I go in the, very early in the morning. I was quite actually uh, close to the stage. And I can say to you with certainty, it's not just the Iranians who love Pink Floyd. They played four songs in that show yes it was i mean it was towards the end of it it was darker hang on a and second hang on a second Let, hang on hang on let yes. me just catch people up to this in case they're not pink floyd fanatics yes. uh, it, the, the the deal is that pink floyd the two pillars of Pl floyd no disrespect to richard wright and uh, nick mason and even sim barrett the two pillars of pink floyd are roger waters and david gilmore they 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 they, they bat heads they have trouble with each other etc by 1983 waters famously leaves pink floyd um or pink Pink Floyd leaves Roger Waters, <laughs> uh, and <laughs> and they don't they don't reconcile for you know some twenty years, and then in something of a surprise, um, at the in the famous Live Aid you know massive benefit concert in London, they reunite one time only. Um, it's punctuated at the end by uh, Waters calling uh, uh, Gilmore over, and they they kind of hug a little bit and 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 do a bow. Um, but this is in Pink Floyd myth mythology. This is the the great moment where they've returned to each other uh, one last time, and you and you were there, and I was there, and I was there. It was. I'm. I'm, I'm telling you. So it's not. I'm, I'm, my theory is. I mean, it's not just Iranians. I mean, I know in Iran they became huge, and and, and they have fans like uh, crazy, and it's like very unique. But. Um, I was looking around me when they played. They played four songs. When they played uh, "Wish You Were Here," there were like over a hundred thousand people in that concert. Uh, everybody around me was in tears, including me. I shouldn't say it, but uh, it, was, it was very emotional. So, so you think you can tell heaven from hell, blue skies from. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail? A smile from a veil? Do you think you can tell? People love them. Yeah, but the theory, but with respect, I mean, we're not here to 
prove the theory that Pink Floyd <laughs> Pink Floyd's just, a famous just, band. Just, we, we we know but, we know they're the a classic point, band. The point, I'm, I'm the point bragging, is I'm is that why you mentioned there. the Beatles. I, I mean, why why has this band you know uh, caught magic in 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 Iran? So uh, another example I want I want to give you is in, they had the Roger Waters or Pink Floyd uh, the rest of them <laughs> I had the concert in Dubai when I was uh, in Iran and. I think in, in the in the concert, most most of people there were Iranians, and that also proves your proves your point that yeah, Pink Floyd are huge within the Iranian communities. But but you, I mean, I, I can give you some some more examples, not not as, not of a same scale, but a band like, for example, I give you Anathema, or I mean, Anathema is not a great example. Uh, another band called uh, Archive, for example, British band. But then they're, they're not they're not big at all in London. I just went to see them. Probably think they, they draw the same no, number no. as I do. Which was I like, mean, they're great. Like, when we, in fact, we have Roya Adab coming up in just a, a little bit on this part one of the series. But uh, no one really knows Archive. Uh, not really around the world. I mean, I, other than you and Iranians, but yeah, no one knows. they're really not that in well. In Iran, known. they're huge, for example. I mean, everybody knows in Iran. And uh, I mean, and on the case of, um, you know, uh, six so... Um, uh, Rodriguez, I, I, I still stick to that theory that somebody, some interesting person probably brought this to Iran, the Pink Floyd music to Iran, and then the, 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 cir the circle of that person might have been uh, interesting as well, and that should have uh, been the cause of this music growing right. like wildfire. I think that that's my theory, anyways. Ali Azimi, you're you're the best. It's always great to talk to you. I appreciate your Likewise. fandom and your zeal and uh, your personal stories about Pink Floyd. Thanks for contributing to this, my friend. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks for having me. Khodafis. Khodafis. Remember when you were young? <laughs> you shone like the sun. This is a Rook special, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession, coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. Also, for all the episodes in one place, you can see them at our website, rookmedia.com. Well, our next guest on part one of this series is a composer, bassist, and bass guitar instructor. He is the co-founder and leader of the fusion band Domahi. Dara Darai was born in 1978 in Tehran. He started his musical journey at the age of 13 on the guitar. He started playing in an underground band and switched to the bass and has since become one of Iran's most prominent and accomplished bass players. Dara has worked with scores of artists in Iran, composing, arranging, performing different styles of music from Persian rock, jazz fusion, alternative and pop to theater and film soundtracks. And right now, Dara Darai joins me from Tehran. Hello, sir. Hello, Gian. Uh, nice talking to you, and thank you for having me. I'm very glad uh, that we're going to discuss about this subject, which is my favorite subject. <laughs> it's such a it's a, such a pleasure to to speak to you. You're such a great player. You are a bass player, so I have to think that. You're, you're you're a Roger Waters fan on one level or another, but let, take me back, Dara. Do you remember when you first heard Pink Floyd? Yes, I can remember that. Um, actually, uh, I was introduced to Pink Floyd by uh, one of my father's friend. I already played guitar for a while, and uh, he gave me this tape and told me that this is a uh, Pink Floyd record. But after uh, some years, I realized that um, actually that wasn't a Pink Floyd record. It was a Richard Wright's solo album. Oh, wow. And I'm uh, very grateful about that because um, Richard Wright is a very uh, important point in Pink Floyd history. The late Richard Wright, of course, he's he's no longer yeah. with us. But, uh, but it's so interesting that your connection point with Pink Floyd was not the guitarist or the bass player, but the keyboard guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. 
Uh, and um, to be honest, I didn't like it. Pink Floyd was um, unusual for me at first. So I didn't like it. Then I watched Pink Floyd live at Pompeii hmm. video, which was mind blowing and really attracted me to the band. For the first time, I could be able to uh, see the musicians' faces, and hmm. that was very good. And um, I remember my vision of Roger Waters was from a very uh, slow tracking <laughs> shot with. You, you know that. Yeah, I know it. I know I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after a while, um, mm, when my father passed away, um, I came across uh, uh, the Wall album, which um, kind of uh, um, resonated with my feelings uh, then. Hmm. Darjan, uh, when, when, when was that, that your, your dear father passed away? Um, I was 16, so it... Mid-90s. Yes, yeah. 1994. Ah. So at the age of 16, you start rediscovering these these iconic Pink Floyd records. Listen, the, the idea of this special is to try to uh, canvas a bunch of opinion, ask a bunch of different people um, from different walks of musical life in the Iranian diaspora and within Iran, why they mm -hmm. think Pink Floyd has had this connection, why there's such an affection amongst Iranians for Pink Floyd. So you're not just a musician, but you're a musician who's dabbled in various genres. You're a producer, you're an arranger, you have a sense of music. What is your sense of why Pink Floyd has resonated so much? There might be a number of reasons for that. Uh, first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that this music is uh, very much attached to the literature. And um, we as Iranians, um, in Iranian culture, we are also very uh, much uh, literature oriented. And um, for Iranians always, literature comes first when, uh, in terms of listening to music. Also, the whole concept of lyrics uh, in Pink Floyd music is very in, uh, in touch with human in general. Uh -huh. and, uh, we as Iranians uh, also have experienced these senses of, um, for example, alienation that, uh, for example, they uh, mm, talk about it in the Wall album, which is um, which I believe that um, that's the most uh, understood Pink Floyd album in Iran. Yes, yes. And uh, also uh, other senses, like um, be, be a victim be, or uh, greed and death. These are uh, really common human issues. Um, the other thing, beside lyrics, the other thing, it's the music itself, which um, is very simple and very narrative and uh, very dreamy. And um, uh, also, it's very visual. Uh, I mean, I used to listen to Pink Floyd with closed eyes and uh, try to imagine all the pictures in the music. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 um, there are so many details in, um, in the music. So in general, we love these things. Um, and uh, Pink Floyd music is very simple and complex at the same time. And uh. Uh, yes, I, I think of these two uh, major... Uh, elements in their music. Let, let me ask you about the, uh, I mean, the lyric side, a few people have noted and the, the kind of poetry of some of the lyrics or the way some of the lyrics speak to Iranians, especially in The Wall and, and some of the other uh, uh, prominent records. Um, let me ask you about the musical side. When you talk about dreamy, that dreamy mm -hmm. progressive rock or psychedelic even sound, mm -hmm. 
Um, there was an mm-hmm. interesting uh, comment that um, in Iranian, certainly in Iranian classical music, but in Iranian music that people are used to, it's not necessarily oh. caught up into three and a half minute pop songs the way you'd be used to in the West. And so the fact that Pink Floyd music goes on and has this kind of, it can can be elastic, can be longer sometimes, can be 20 minute compositions, can be concept albums that, that, go, that flow from one song to the other, actually makes a lot of sense to Iranians musically D- does that make sense mm-hmm. to you yes of course of course that's a good point the other thing um, is uh, that um, they use a lot of space in their music you know uh, words and guitar parts come and make um, their own statements and suddenly there is a space for the listener to digest it And this is a very important technique in uh, music production. Do you have a sense of, I mean, it was a little before your time when a lot of these bands emerged in the, in the seventies before you were born, but you know, going into the 80s and 90s, if it's about people discovering Pink Floyd through their older brothers or sisters or fathers, as you've said, you know, do you have a sense of why Iranians were have been attracted to what we call sometimes progressive rock? I mean, the, the music of Pink Floyd and, and groups like Yes and King Crimson and all of that going back to the 1970s, as opposed to Boston and the Rolling Stones and the Who. In general, I think um, our love for uh, progressive music is because of our uh, tendency towards complexity, in a way. Uh, I mean, uh, we have so many stories and fairy tales that uh, it's about um, someone should cross so many levels of difficult uh, situations to finally find something blissful and um, good and something spiritual, like salvation and liberty and pure love. I think that's the Eastern uh, viewpoint um, in general. And I think it's in in our DNA somehow. So uh, we carry it in other aspects of life, um, especially in arts. Uh, For example, in painting, we have miniature, which is a very elegant style of of painting, and it's uh, full of details, and it's an effortful um, job for an artist to do that. So um, that leads, obviously, to our taste in music and uh, progressive music is also very um, sophisticated music it's uh, it's like a journey and uh, um, it's got so many changes in uh, musical elements like um, for example melody uh, harmony uh, rhythm and um, so uh, in general, it makes sense to us. I mean, um, not to all of us, but uh, maybe to to the uh, educated middle class uh, section of society, which I think it's the majority of uh, Iranians' uh, nation. That answer was brilliant. I really appreciate that. Let me ask you, as a bass player now, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I just I, I get your feelings about. It. I mean, you sound like you've become a Pink Floyd fan. If you even if you weren't when you first heard the Richard Wright records for the first time, um, uh, wh- tell talk to me about uh, about Roger Waters as a bass player because um, you know he's obviously not Stanley Clark. He's not even Tony Levin. I mean, he's not. You know, he, he doesn't wow you with these fast chops or something. But there seems to be something really poetic in the way in what he brings to those bass lines, especially through those classic records like Dark Side of the Moon and, and through the 1970s and Into the Wall. Tell me how you see him as a bass player, given that you're such a, a prominent bass player yourself. Honestly, Roger Waters was one of the reasons that I switched to bass, because 
um, I, I really love the band so much, and um, R- Roger Waters w- was my favorite mem- member, among others. And um, yes, um, I-, I was very influenced by him and his bass playing. I started playing bass with the pick because he was doing that, and um, I-, I really liked his style. I used to like him very much, but when I um, got more into bass to technical part naturally um when i listen to pink floyd um maybe i have this uh, kind of critical uh, viewpoint of his playing somehow but still i think he has done the best parts in uh, pink floyd um, bass work uh, all of it and um by the way some um, tracks has been played by David Gilmore. Right. Actually, I knew that. It's true. You're right. Yes. I'm really influenced by him. And but can you, mm-hmm. if you can put it into words, for non-musicians, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of the people listening right now are obviously going to be musicians or people who are really into Floyd or whatever, but there's a big audience out there listening who are not uh, uh, proficient, are not bass players. <laughs> can How would you explain what 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 it was about the way Roger Waters plays or what he brought to the music that so inspired you that you wanted to play bass after listening to him? Um, well, he was very simple and very lyrical. And um, the m- most important fact for me then was the lines was uh, played uh, in a way that I could play with um, with my technique. Back then, you know, uh, that was, right. uh, yes, that was very important for me when I think of it. Did I answer your you question? You did, well? you did, you did. It was great. I've so enjoyed talking to you. I am really, uh, I, I, I have to be so grateful that you've been part of the special. Let me ask you a final question. Uh, as a mm-hmm. musician currently working in Tehran, um, mm-hmm. What do you think that Pink, I mean, you know, uh, one of the observations I've made is that unlike, say, the UK or Canada or the US where I've lived and worked in my life, um, where Pink Floyd would be something for an older generation at this point, you kind of have to be over, you know, 35, 40 years of age to even really know much Pink Floyd stuff. Uh, it, it occurs to me that there's a younger generation in Iran or, or of Iranians, millennials, people in their 20s, 30s who know the Pink Floyd catalog or no Floyd, what would you say Pink Floyd means to musicians today in Iran? I I think the impact um, has been huge in Iran. I personally know every song. I can play it for you. I know every chord, every uh, every word, uh, and um, uh, no other bands have such impact on me personally. And uh, I'm sure that um, so many other musicians in Iran uh, is like me. And um, actually, I think the most um, guitar players in Iran um, are somehow influenced by David Gilmore. Um, they are buying Stratocasters uh, since uh, 1970. <laughs> Up until now, <laughs> right, right. because of David Gilmore, so it's it's uh, it's an en- enormous impact, and um, I personally um, can find um, their footprints in my um, different uh, stages of uh, professional uh, career as a bass player or as a composer, and um, I-, I think of something. Maybe it's wrong, but. Um, I don't think that before the revolution, Pink Floyd was that um, effective on Iranian musicians. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but um, large impact was after revolution, mostly from early um, 80s um, until now. um, But I can say that by talking to the musicians from um, that era, I mean, um, older musicians, which I am working with, um, they were um, in, in, in local bands, they were uh, performing in clubs, 
bands uh, such as um, uh, Scorpio or uh, Rebels, they, they were covering songs in um, clubs, and covering was the trend in that moment in uh, Iran. But not most um, musicians back then were uh, covering Pink Floyd songs. I, I don't know why. Maybe really a revolution and uh, the wall album was uh, the turning point for iranian society to um interest in 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 this music interesting i you know yes. I, I i lied to you because i said that the, that was the final question i actually ha now this is the final question <laughs> and and it's a very it's a very controversial question uh and a very sensitive one and i forgive me for asking for putting you on the spot like this uh uh i, I don't know if you will ever forgive me but what is the best pink floyd album oh uh, I'm really a animals fan. Oh, this is, yes, see, this you is you my... you go deep, and do you, um, and I mean, well, animals is difficult. I was going to say, is there a song? But the the entire album is basically a song. So, I, but but is there a particular song that if you were you know come home at the end of the day and you want to close your eyes and put on a Pink Floyd song, you would play? Yes, always. Dogs would be the one. Dogs is my favorite. I, I, I get goosebumps every time I uh, listen to that song, really. Spoken like a, a, a true musician, you, you pick the song that's 45 minutes long. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, uh, Dara, it has uh, been such a pleasure. Your insights were very interesting and very unique in, in this uh, special. Uh, you're a great player. It's great to be in touch, and I hope to to see you or speak to you before too long. Thanks, my brother. Thank you for having me. Uh, I was very glad to talk to you and great questions and great Merci. points. Thank you. Merci. Bye-bye. 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 Listening to part one of a Rook special, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession, coming to you on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube. Also, for all the episodes in one place and for all of our other episodes, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com. My next guest is an Iranian musician, a music producer, a record label owner in Iran. He is the founder of Hermes Records, and he's also been the director of the international section of the Fajr Music Festival in Tehran. Ramin Sadiqi was born in Vienna to a family of artists. He moved to Tehran in 1978. About 20 years ago, Ramin founded Hermes Records and has also hosted dozens of well-known jazz and world musicians in Iran. He is the co-founder of the Culture and Music monthly magazine, and he's also the founder of the Show of Hands International Improvisation Festival in Tehran, and he's producing two albums right now. But first, Ramin Sadiqi joins us from Tehran, Iran right now. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Good to have you on this program, <laughs> Ramin. Thank you. I know you're a bass player. How, how aware of Pink Floyd were you when you were growing up in, uh, in I guess, in Austria and then in Iran in the 1980s? Oh well, uh, to be honest, I I was and I and I'm still one of the fanatic fans of Pink Floyd, thanks to my uncle uh, who introduced me to Pink Floyd. Uh, it was on our way from Tehran to the Caspian Sea in the mountain road, um, and he played me the metal album uh, and that famous piece Echoes. Right. And I still remember I was at that time I think five years old, and that middle part of that piece, which were only sound effects. 
it was so scary to me that I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. But uh, since I think that time I got connected to Pink Floyd and that uh, love relation hasn't been cut so far. Wow, not a lot of five-year-olds discover Pink Floyd. It's it's a little bit more sophisticated. <laughs> that is particularly young, so I think you really qualify as a real fan. Was your desire to become a bass player a, a desire to be uh, an Iranian Roger Waters? No, that's not true. Uh, it, it didn't happen to occur to me. Uh, I was become. I mean, uh, I decided to become a bass player when I heard for the first time uh, Stanley Clark playing ah. with Chico Rio in the album Return to Forever. So it was more about a, a kind of a modern jazz, jazz album, right. which connected because before I was playing the classical guitar. But of course, uh, I would love to have uh, Roger Waters' bass in my hand. You know, you are a musician. You've been involved in music in so many different ways throughout your lifetime. You're sitting there in Iran. You are the perfect person for me to test my hypothesis, which is that there is um, an outstanding connection between Iranians and Pink Floyd for one reason or another. And by the way, I, I can't think of a better example than a kid who was five years old who became intoxicated with the sounds of Pink Floyd. Before you <laughs> before you give me your official uh, decision on whether you think there is some special relationship tell me why at least you think iranians would love pink floyd so much what is it in pink floyd's music that would resonate with iranians um i mean about this issue many people talk before many also had written essays in, in music magazines but this is what i have observed during my lifetime living here in iran um Concerning Pink Floyd and um, their popularity in Iran, uh, to be honest, uh, what happened during the 70s in Iran is nothing unusual or nothing very extraordinary. The Iranian middle class uh, got aware about their music in the same fashion that perhaps a British or a German music lover got connected to Pink Floyd. I'm uh, among of those people mm -hmm. who is going to overrule that, uh, let's say, exaggerated way that we are expressing that the Pink Floyd was untouchable progressive rock band in Iran. No, that's not true. In the 70s, it grew in the same fashion like other countries and other bands and other groups. I mean, according to their uh, presence in the music market uh, throughout the world or their popularity, they also become here popular. So in the 70s, uh, I think nothing very strange happened between the relation of the Iranian okay. audience. And what Pink about Floyd. the 80s? That's the point. I mean, uh, I'm among of those who's uh, saying that actually the, the growing popularity that perhaps for many people outside of Iran is coming a bit strange between the listeners here and the Pink Floyd was not actually during their active years, but somehow during their passive years, when Pink Floyd was reaching the end of their career as a forehead band. So if we consider the wall as the end right. of their real career, the revolution already started in Iran. So we got isolated in the 80s because of many reasons with the Western world. First, the revolution itself, which consumed, I think, all the concentrations of the Iranian about their internal affairs. And then immediately, a year after almost, the war between Iran and Iraq started. It lasted for eight years. So um, it's very understandable that the Iranian society was involved in other issues than what's happening in the West. That isolation actually um, left us no other way to get or to stay connected to what we inherited in the 70s. You know, so in the 70s, Pink Floyd was popular. Um, we had no connection to get connected to newer music. So we had to shuffle back into our own archive and into our own deposits that we had from the pre-revolution. So, Ramin, you're saying that in the 80s, uh, a lot of those folks then would return to Dark Side of the Moon or Wish You Were Here to those 1970s uh, Pink Floyd albums that they would have already owned. And you know why? I mean, it, it was not just because the quality of Pink Floyd. I think uh, uh, when, when it comes to progressive rock and rock music, the reason that the Iranians in the 80s got reconnected to Pink Floyd more than other kind of music yes. of the 70s yes. was that the other bands were actually not 
being good in the period of mid 70s to the late 70s i mean just name all the famous bands okay who well, were in this, the this same is where no, i'm gonna I, I, work, i'm like, gonna cut you off i'm gonna cut you off because there's a few things i've got to push back on for first of all the latent assumption that i think would uh uh you're, you're clearly some kind of pink floyd purist who believes that uh pink floyd really wasn't the band after roger waters left i mean there were some notable albums after a momentary lapse of reason the division bell i mean some people think those are good records i do but 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 okay i'll of take course, your no, no, no. i don't overrule that but i mean the the golden time of pink floyd sure, was sure uh in the 70s but this thing about the 70s and you saying well pink floyd was just like any other band uh in terms of how mad oof how how well they how how many people were connecting with them in a moment i want to ask you about why um why progressive rock is something that really emerged as something that a lot of Iranians love. Progressive rock in particular, um, it, you know, because it, it isn't really at the top of the list necessarily in, say, North America or in England where I grew up. It, it, it was very popular, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have trumped a lot of other genres of music the way it does seemingly with Iranians. Let me say this in terms of pushing back on the Pink Floyd in the 70s just being another band thing. In my lifetime, in my mm -hmm. lifetime, uh, I guess other than maybe one or two guys I know who were born outside of Iran like me and lived their entire life outside of Iran, I don't think one Iranian has ever come up to me obsessed with the Rolling Stones. I can't remember one Iranian coming up to me going, hey man, is it Exile on Main Street or Some Girls? Which one's your favorite album? Or I can't stop playing Sympathy for the Devil. <laughs> I mean, the Rolling <laughs> Stones are probably, you know, usually put next to the Beatles as the greatest rock and roll band ever or whatever. They're certainly Absolutely. as big as Pink Floyd. So, so there is something in the water when Iranians are responding to Pink Floyd and seemingly have never heard of the Rolling Stones or have very little to say about the Rolling Stones, who were huge in the 1970s, to undermine your, your thesis. They were huge in the 1970s. That was the golden period of the Rolling Stones. Why, why in the 80s and, and I guess beyond weren't Iranians returning to their Rolling Stones records? What is it about Pink Floyd? We are going to split our talk into the two sections. <laughs> Let's stick to the first one, which you mentioned about Rolling Stones and why progressive rock instead of such a enormously famous and great rock and roll band right yes, Rolling Stones. thank you yes i mean this is, this is something that I, I think goes back into our culture um the progressive rock scene was something new uh, i mean starting in the mid 60s let's say uh but uh, the content of the progressive rock music there was more mysticism in that kind of music compared to what the Beatles or Rolling Stones played. I mean, I, I'm also a Beatles fan more than a Rolling Stone fan. And uh, so they were known actually in Iran, but the, the educated middle class, let's say in Tehran, they, they got more connected to progressive rock and even a progressive electronic music. I mean, uh, not just Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd. I mean, Tangerine Dream and Klaus Schultz were right. as famous. Yeah. Right. King Crimson. That, that yeah. King Crimson as well. Uh, I think this is also a bit connected to our culture, to our literature, and to that mysticism that you may be able to to exploit with progressive rock, but with, I mean, basic uh, popular rock and roll music. It was quite something ordinary perhaps i mean this is just a speculation yes, uh, i'm yes. not talking about facts it's just my my understanding or my observation about that circle of people that i was in relation in iran so this is nothing very 100 percent uh, fact-based but i think it's a bit connected to our culture and literature so in that part i can i mean close the dossier why pink floyd and not rolling stone but if you jump back into the progressive rock part, I think other bands in the progressive rock scene did Pink Floyd a favor that from mid 70s to late 70s, they did not do anything good. I mean, if you, I, I mean, this is also, but again, my opinion. Uh, if you, <laughs> if you look back to the albums which got released from 1974, five up to 1980, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, nothing, just Love Beach, uh, a very, I mean, very bad album, I think, for a progressive rock fan. Talking about Genesis, exactly during the same time, Peter Gabriel left the band and then they were become three persons, Trick of a Tale or 
and then there were three albums. These two albums were really not Genesis. Uh, when you talk about Jethro Tull, Jethro Tull's golden years were in the early 70s with Thick as a Brick, perhaps. Kansas in the States, they become more commercial. Doors was not existing anymore. You're talking about Yes, for instance. I mean, Tormato or Going for the One, they were really not the best albums that okay. Yes ever produced okay. and released. King Crimson was out of the scene. So when... Uh, when in the 80s we had no uh, material to feed our ears from the past years and whatever was left were actually not really interesting albums, Pink Floyd became more and more popular because they were in the heart of their best releases like Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall. I think it's, it's a double-sided blade. We cannot give all the credits to Pink Floyd. We can also give a part of the credits to the other bands who were not that much good in their late 70s productions. So, um, uh, first of all, I love you so much, man. A guy sitting there on the other side in, in Tehran who I could talk with, about rock with for forever. It's, 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 <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. But he, here's the funny thing to me. If the argument is that Pink Floyd, and I hear this argument and I want it to be true, right? Pink Floyd is making this mystical, sophisticated, musically intensive um poetic lyrics kind of deep music and mm -hmm. iranians are this deep people steeped in poetry and they want something more profound out of their popular culture so they're gravitating to to pink floyd how do you explain the simultaneous uh, love for mindless, horrible Euro disco music like modern talking that the rest of the the rest of the world never gravitated towards. How do we explain that that divide? Very simple. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, if I go to a wedding party, I never dance with Shajarian. So um, fair enough. Uh, I will I will stick to some pop music. And modern talking was a very stereotype based, shallow pop music. Uh, which the people had fun with it here. You know, I tell you something else, even in the rock scene, how come that the Iranians so much like Alan Parsons project or how much they like Camel? I mean, I, I'm quite sure that these bands even are not so much known in, in right. England. There's another strange thing. I've been canvassing opinion here amongst Iranians I know uh, and trying to reach out to people, you know, at least across North America. These, these would be Iranian expats, people who've come from Iran who live in the diaspora and asking them. And there's something that, that's very interesting to me, which is that for, for the most part, you know, if you are under the age of, I'd say, 35, maybe even 40 uh, in North America and you grew up here, you probably don't know that much about Pink Floyd or, or you know, you might have heard of the, of, of the name of the band. Uh, you might have seen, you know, The Wall at some point or something, but you really don't know that much about Pink Floyd if you've heard of, the, of them at all. I could not find any Iranians, including in their 20s, who didn't know Pink Floyd. So that that's very interesting to me because these people weren't around. They're not reliving their years from the 1970s. I mean, these are people who were born in the 90s, right? You must have a sense of why they would know Pink Floyd so profoundly. I think a, a part of it also uh, is related to the social scene in each country. I mean... Uh, you're comparing Iran with the States, where perhaps youngsters are not much uh, in or not favor, but are not much knowing about Pink Floyd, let's say. But you have to be tr uh, honest with yourself. I mean, the marketing system there to promote new products is totally different with what we have here. I mean, okay. we are still, uh, I don't want to tag a third world country to Iran, but we are a bit out of that stream. So things here becoming more carved in minds of people and they inherit it and they move it forward to the next generation. I mean, the marketing here is not in the hands of Billboard or the Rolling Stone magazine. It's the hand of your elderly brother your, or your uncle. Perfect. Or your, so it's quite obvious that people here, even if they are 15 years old, still hear the name Pink Floyd because the, the, the previous generations, they talk about it, they play and compared to what's happening there, so much bombarding of information and new products. I mean, I have this 
same problem with Spotify, too, for instance. I don't say that, but Spotify is feeding you with so much new stuff that you sometimes even forget what you have heard a week <laughs> before, true. even if you have liked it. It's true. It's true. So two final questions. First of all, do you put any credence? Do you think that there is anything to the notion? Some people have argued that because the wall came out at the same time as the revolution, essentially, and because it had this anti-establishment um, message, mm -hmm. that that was something that particularly resonated for Iranians in the post-revolutionary uh, fallout. Do you, what do you think of that? I have no idea, to be honest. I don't want just to make a statement without having any uh, relation to it. I don't think that The Wall, I mean, The Wall was an important album, even for here, because, I mean, we were during rebel times here, change and everything. But I don't think that it had an extra impact for their popularity, or at least I'm not aware of. Okay. And, and and a final question, Ramin, I mean, as a as not just a man who does a lot of producing and, and runs a record label and all that, but as a musician, what what do you think the impact of Pink Floyd has been on Iranian musicians? Very much, to be honest. I mean, technique wise, I mean, I think um, David Gilmour and his guitar and the way that he played was so inspiring to many youngsters here to those who followed rock music. Uh, so as a specific instrument, I mean, but in general, the atmosphere of Pink Floyd's music was also in general, very much inspiring to many youngsters and musicians here. I mean, this is not something that you cannot deny. It, it had a very heavy impact on their mindset of making music. Un uh, until new forms of music grew here from the 90s onwards, when people listen more to jazz, listen more to progressive jazz, uh, also to alternative rock and indie rock. But before that, I think Pink Floyd, Camel, by surprise, because I think they are much more popular in Iran compared to England. Or I've never even UK heard of them. I, I don't even know. They who were you... actually the role models for many musicians. What, what is this band? What are you saying? What's the name? Camel. Camel? Camel, yeah. Camel. I've never even heard of Camel. That's amazing. That, uh, that's that's the point. That's the point. Yeah. So, I mean, they are so popular in Iran that they can fill the football stadium. This is amazing. We've actually found a we in this conversation. We found a tipping point. A band that was big in Iran that sounds like they they're a little better than Modern Talking too. And uh, <laughs> and that 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 I've really as a as a music fan, a musician, a musicologist here in the West, I've never even heard of them. The Iranians are always good for surprises. Uh, Ramin Sadiri, it's it's such a pleasure to talk to you. You are um, your your wisdom has been so important. I love your story, and I love uh, talking to you. And I hope we can do it again, my friend. I hope we can do it in person sometime too. Same here. Thank you very much for your call, and have a great day. Thank you, Ramin Jam. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao. You are listening to a Rook four-part original series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. Our final guest on part one of this series is a musician, archaeologist, and curator of cultural events celebrating MENA heritage with a focus on Iran. Roya Arab was one of the original members of the band Archive, releasing Londinium in 1996 before working with artists including Groove Rider, Leila, and Mike Figgis. She then took a decade out of music to study at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London. Since returning to music, she has performed with Iranian musicians 
musicians such as Puya Mahmoudi, Arshid Azarin, Ash Kusha, and Hitch Kass. More recently, she has been investigating Iranian film music and what it tells us about the changes in perception of music and musicians in Iran. And right now, Roya Arab joins me from London, England. Hello. Hello, Jianjian. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. Uh, first things first, were you, are you a Pink Floyd fan? No, but <laughs> I will say... We're off to a good start. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm on. You, you, you can only get the truth from me. <laughs> okay. Well, as I see it, I may, you know. Um, uh, but I tell you what, I'm aware of this sort of massive impact they've had on Iran. So when you, uh, your people approached me about this, I actually did some research because I find it personally really interesting, the grip they have on the nation as well. So I'm glad of the question. I've sort of approached it a bit academically. I'm glad. I'm happy to have your academic uh, <laughs> prowess at work here. Uh, I, I mean, the, it, I should say, maybe we should start off with, with musical genres because you were in the band Archive, a group that mm -hmm. you know has often been identified as being in the progressive rock genre. And this is a, a style of rock music that Iranians seem, seem to particularly gravitate towards. Why do Iranians, in your view, have an affection or interest in progressive rock, atmospheric rock, fusion rock in specific, more than, say, the rock and roll of the Rolling Stones or the Who? Um, first, if I may be so bold as to just make one slight correction. When I worked with Archive, we were actually a trip-hop band. That's right. And actually, that's true. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And then later, when they had Craig Walker join them, he's the one who took them into this whole progressive rock scene. Right. I think what it is we've got to look at is Iran before, you've got to really start from the 1950s and go forth, to be really frank with you, too, in order to address this question properly. Okay. It's not that Iranians were just into progressive rock. At the very beginning, when uh, acts like Black Cats, who were uh, without question one of the bands who really, they would literally copy the music of the uh, rock bands in the 60s that was going on in Europe and America, and they would feed it to the Iranians who were so happy to consume it. Um, I was sort of looking at um, Pink Floyd. Three words come to mind when it comes to this sort of uh, the popularity to begin with of this band. And it's avant-garde, psychedelic, and philosophical. Okay. Three things that they managed to bring to the table. So, and if you look at, for example, Iran in the 50s, I mean, I must say that because I'd been doing some film stuff, like if you look at something like Farrukh Ghaffari's film, Junub Shah, South of the City in 1958, something that's amazing about that film is it shows you all the various venues and all the various musicians as such that are around in the late 50s. Then if you jump to a film like Can Do in 1975, suddenly you will see this whole pop scene, club scene. So I think one should really look at facilities, what was available in the country, the social aspect, the technological aspect, the intellectual aspect, the economic aspect, but more than anything, the drugs. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, let yeah. me let, let me get to the drugs in a, in a moment. But let me take these three words you've come up with: avant-garde, psychedelic, and philosophical. Are are we to then conclude that Iranians are, uh, I mean, Iranian youth post-revolution are more attracted to things that are avant-garde and philosophical than not? Ah, na na na. These three words go back. To the 70s my friend okay when i questioned people like my own sister who was part of the hippie brigade and used to be in the american community school had been educated in the west uh, when we talk about things like philosophical it's the fact that they, they actually had poetry with meaning which obviously resonates so really we cannot look at pink floyd post-revolution without looking at it pre-revolution because when the revolution happened it was the tapes of these people in the 70s, like my sister, like my cousin, who was a lover of music, it was these tapes, once the revolution happened, you didn't have access to the West, that these kids got to hear. Right. So it's really the earlier generation that brought it to the later generation. But why wasn't and, it the tapes of the Rolling Stones? Um, you know, 
This is a very good question. But I, <laughs> Thank you. The Rolling, St yeah, the Rolling Stones weren't that philosophical. Sympathy for the devil is about as philosophical as they got, mate. Exactly. So you are then saying that philosophical, I mean, this this also explains, like I, I, know, I know Iranians uh, are not unfamiliar with Madonna, but from mm -hmm. my unscientific survey over the last uh, mm -hmm. few weeks of, of and, and really of people I've known over the years, of, of people in their 20s, not just uh, you know over 40 people in their 20s 30s and 40s who are of Iranian background they are more likely to know Pink Floyd and even be able to recite Pink Floyd lyrics or know Pink Floyd songs than they are Madonna uh, and Madonna okay. you know in that say Madonna should be someone that they grew up with but it didn't break through in Iran so ah so, wait one moment who would ever want to bloody well the uh, her lyrics are rubbish who would want to sing <laughs> like a virgin look we're talking about it's, okay, if you want to jump to the post-revolution era, apart from the tapes that reached them, the intellectual leftists actually sat down and uh, translated the lyrics of Pink Floyd. Uh. A magazine that was set up concentrated on bringing the best of what was thought-wise and music-wise and culture-wise to the people. No one bothered to, uh, no offense to Madonna, she's a rubbish singer as well, but a really good songwriter, <laughs> great songwriter. A good performer, a good performer. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Right. But even performers, let's be honest, she can't really sing. <laughs> but um, that aside, um, the point is, my friend, there was a real intellectual leftist slant. You, we cannot underestimate the importance of lyrics like industry reach for the sky, choking the atmosphere, sulfur and carbon and hydrogen. This was in 1973 in Breathe. Yes, on the album of the dark side of the moon. But do you? But but Roy, just, just uh, the reason I've been focusing on post revolution is not because there yeah. weren't Pink Floyd fans in Iran before the revolution, but that the hypothesis, at least, is that. Pre-revolution, 1970s, there's a bunch of Western music that's making it into Iran. There's a bunch of fans of Western music in Iran. But that Pink Floyd is just one of the bands that everybody is interested in. But that after the revolution, Pink Floyd sort of zooms ahead and becomes um, goes further into the DNA of the Iranian youth than, than other classic uh, Western uh -huh. rock bands. And that's the question. And, and of course, does that have to do with, I mean, the one, the game changer in the middle of all that is that the, the wall comes out in 1970. And the same yes, time indeed. as the revolution. And is that the precipitant then for a, a great deal more of interest in Pink Floyd, which leads people to go back mm -hmm. to their older brother's tapes from 1973? Do you know what's weird? What we've got to bear in mind is the wall. May, I remember watching the wall in boarding school because they on Sundays, there used to be this charge. Show, no, on Tuesdays, they used to be top of the pops. And I remember. My fellow Iranians weren't watching that. My cousin had to return with the tape for them to then be. We have to consider dissemination. My yes, friend. yes. Post revolution. First of all, we didn't have the internet. Satellite took a very long time to arrive. So it would have been the elders' record collections and tapes. Then we have, for example, the first underground rock musician to actually play underground in Iran illegally was Arash Mitui. He was actually the child of Sina Bina and Ezatollah Mitui. Yes. One of the people who brought the sounds of people like Pink Floyd. So you had these kids who had been born in the 60s or 50s, were performing underground post-revolution, and it was the sounds of Pink Floyd that seems to have really resonated with them. We then have the wall arrive. The wall didn't come immediately. So it was a really drip, drip, drip situation. You have the People like Arash Mitui, people who were of the older generation with their tapes, playing Pink Floyd, playing Rolling Stone. And then when they listen to something like, wow, this 15 minute long sort of music. And if you're into drugs, you'll enjoy it with your drugs. If you're listening to the lyrics, you get carried away with the lyrics. And again, the lyrics, not everyone understood them. It wasn't until they started getting translated officially. There were books being written about important lyrics such as these. 
So you, we, we can't imagine, oh, in Iran, the wall arrived, and in 1980, everyone was watching it. No, it took them a decade before they got the tapes to them. You know what I mean? Yes, I, I, this is all so good. I'm, 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 I'm listening, I'm learning. Let me ask you this, when it comes to, because you meant, you've mentioned lyrics a few times, um, mm-hmm. and, and, I, and, and it's clear to me, speaking to you, uh, uh, I, I've known of you for a long time, I've been looking forward to chatting with you, but this is our first time mm-hmm. talking. It's clear to me that you don't traffic in bullshit. You, 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 are, you are you're a straight shooter. So let me ask you this: yeah. Do we, as we like to say, as Iranians, oh, we had this tradition of you know we come steeped in poetry. We have Hafez and Rumi and Saadi dripping off of us. So of course we gravitate to philosophical, profound uh, lyrics. Is that really true? I mean, is yes, it, is, yes. As I spoke to a bunch of young people. Again, because of this, I was really intrigued by your thing. Immediately, one of the first things, let me see, the youth said to me, the words they used. I've got it written down here somewhere. I'm a good girl when it comes to studying. Magical, almost from another planet, their music resounded spiritual. And one of the things they kept saying is, look, in the East, we are we do have a more spiritual inclination. And it's true. You look at our simplest pop songs, my friend, something like Hol by Gugush. You sit down and look at those lyrics. Yes, Beautiful. Yes. So yes. even go to the downtown simple songs like A.R. Simone Kaboud, Oh, you bruised sky. What have I done that for a moment I cannot be saved from this pain? Really deep stuff. And that was our bazaari stuff. Do you see what I'm saying? So, yes, it is true. We are steeped in Hafez, Saadi, Rumi. It is inevitable. In the 11th century, we were we, we had an, a master astronomer who was writing the Book of Kings in poetry, for heaven's sake. Yes. You can't dispute that. I don't think we are essentializing if we say that. And by the, and by the way, to underscore this yeah. theory, um, Iranians also, I think, disproportionately loved um, the love of my life, Leonard Cohen. So I, I yes. think I think that that underscores this this notion of the of the attraction, uh, the the need, the desire to to consume good poetry, good lyrics. But can I just ask you? I mean, again, I, yeah. and, and it's it is sort of a apples and oranges thing to just throw out names. But but you know, mm. you're sitting there in England. You're obviously aware that if I would argue potentially in terms of the the the, the size of their tours and the the consistency of their output biggest band of the last four decades you'd say maybe you two and you two are not known for um for you know superficial lyrics they they also have an anti-establishment message they also uh, started as a rebellious kind of band why wouldn't you too become popular in, amongst Iranian youth? I mean, I can't, I can't, I don't even know if I've ever met an Iranian youth who's who's been, you know, who's 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 led with my favorite band is you too, other than those who've grown up in the West. So there again, there's this interesting disconnect for me about why Pink Floyd, but 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 not a group like you two. You see, again, we must go back to context and historical time. So, for example, in the '60s. In Iran, and I, I, if I may be so bold as to sort of give you a little back, sort of backtrack, so you can see please. how the pro- be as bold okay. as you can, please. Okay, uh, to take up, you know. But in the sixties, you had Beatles, Rolling Stones, the Monkees. Now, within Iran, there was a general move away from monophony, uh, mono music, because if you realize with Iran, we used to have this ter- partly because Iranian instruments you can only play in certain keys, and you didn't really have polyphony. You, the Ahang Hoya Mardumi, songs for the people. These were popular songs based on love, using more modern Western musical frames. Then you get the Mutahid, the more engaged music, Novin, inventive. This is in the early 1970s. People start hearing Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Pink Floyd. And importantly, towards the end of the 70s, you have the muta'arriz, the etiraz, the resistance music. So already we had this background of youth in Iran, firstly through drugs, through social interaction, through the fact that nightclubs increased, through the fact that they had more embassies, foreign workers, tourists. You literally, in Iranian films, can see, because I've been charting how various uh, uh, public venues for music have changed through time. This brings with it, and then you have the young people who 
God uh, rest his soul, the uh, last sort of leaders of our country, the Pahlavi family, the, in that time, you really had a lot of young Iranian students sent abroad. Amongst these who were sent abroad, who were paid for by the government, you had a lot of bloody leftist ones as well. And they're the ones, that time there was no YouTube. So they bring back all this music, they, the, it's in the houses, revolution happens. Right. This is the, what the young people have access to. There is no satellite for me to see you two. So I'm going to be consuming the music of my father, my uncle, my older brother. So this is perhaps why a, a, a band like you two, if perhaps we'd had uh, MTV in Iran from the minute that it came to be, maybe the Iranian youth would have been drawn to you two. And, you know, when you look at, for example, this... Um, Let's say I was looking through their lyrics. You know, they put up two fingers to authority much earlier. YouTube, uh, YouTube didn't come to be till the mid '80s, did it? Or early '80s, yeah. But, early, but, 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 but fame came around in 1984. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how are they going to hear it in Iran, my friend? Right, right. In war, and then here I am stuck in war. All I've got is tapes that are being passed around, records that are being passed around in time. Towards the late 80s, early 90s, people start getting satellite. At that point, it's German, uh, funnily enough, I was told. It was the German satellite music channels that they used to get. So we really have to look at dissemination and access. And importantly, the And timing, and timing. So, yes. so Pink Floyd was the the timing was so germane. You know, uh, sorry to cut you off, I'll, uh, but uh, but you know, to draw an, a very interesting parallel that just came to me is that last month we actually did a a show when when Diego Maradona died, talking about the the, the strange connection that Iranians felt towards Maradona. You know, he's mm -hmm. a legendary football player, but why Maradona? Why was and some of the sports you know experts and cultural analysts who've been at this for years said something very similar to what we're talking about right now, which is that there's this epoch in the night of the 1980s where culture becomes extremely repressed and shut down in Iran. And you have to kind of see what's popping through. What's, 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 what are people getting access to? And in a very dark and difficult time, you know, people were still able to one way or another, see the world cup and their aspirations, their energies and their desire for escape is channeled through this guy, Maradona, because that's his period of, of greatness so it's um i might be the first person to ever draw a parallel between maradona and pink floyd but but i think there's something to that would you agree yeah absolutely then you cannot uh, question the ideas of dissemination and access we are so spoiled in the modern world because i can access anyone anytime anywhere i can watch anything anywhere anytime this was not the case in the 1980s in the 1980s all these young intellectual leftists who'd return, hopeful that the revolution was going to give them a chance, which it blimmin' well didn't, it killed the lot off. They're the ones who were sitting there and translating the stuff, this leftist intellectual ideas. So Iran didn't have access. We were in war. Imagine this. We were literally caught up in war. No one was in communication with Iran. The most we had is telephone calls with Iran. So, yes, it is a very important point to make that it's what they had access to. And that's what they responded to, you know? So let me ask you about this. You mentioned it. Where where does drug culture intersect with the disproportionate popularity of Pink Floyd amongst Iranians? Okay, in Iran, in the 1970s, there was a really big hippie, LSD, trippy culture. So, you de and this drug culture, there was two kinds of it. There was the rich culture drug people and there was the lower class heroin drug people so one thing that this pink floyd managed to do is reach both the upper classes and the lower classes ah, interesting drug situation and funnily enough even post-revolution heroin was still one of the things you know this transcended your social class your drug consumption doesn't matter what drug you took what class you came from, their music appealed to the drug era. And that's preceding and post-revolution. But post-revolution, the intellectual slant really is, we cannot underestimate the importance of these 
sort of young people. If my cousin was saying, Roya, one of the things I returned within 1978 was my entire Pink Floyd record collection. Hmm. And he would have shared this with people. And then again, you can't underestimate this, the fact that you actually had underground artists giving Baha, giving sort of respect to Pink Floyd and reflecting the style in their music. Then you have the intellectuals translating what Pink Floyd has to say. Then when the wall arrives, which sticks two fingers up at all manner of authority, mm -hmm. be it the parent, be it the teacher. But what I find really w interesting is that Pink Floyd, pre-1970s, stood for those who wanted a revolution to displace the Pahlavis. By 2010, in Canada, two young kids sit down right. with the promoter Roger Walters right. and write a piece about Ayatollah out. This is a really unique thing for a band to be, for you to be at one point anti one thing and then fighting, being used to fight the very thing you were used to sort of bring about. Indeed, indeed. And we have Sepp Osley coming on, actually one of the members of, uh, the founder of Blurred Vision, uh, who, who came up with that song, Hey Ayatollah, which became a viral hit, um, to talk about this in part two of our series. Uh, Roya, this is, uh, what a joy it is speaking to you, and, and, and what an education. Let me ask you just before I let you go, uh, as a musician, sure. I mean, um, yeah. uh, take off the cultural historian hat and put on the, the, the musician hat. Uh, that's been your bread and butter for so many years as well. Uh, wh what do you think the impact of the interest in a group like Pink Floyd has had on the music coming out of Iran and, and made by Iranians? It occurs to me that that beyond the, the extremes where there, I mean, there's obviously this level of super pop. You know, there's there's this kind of traditional meets disco meets new, you know, EDM that that is the pop music of the of the current you know moment of that Iranians are making out of LA or 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 wherever. And then there's the sonati, there's the classical kind of stuff. But when it comes to rock or jazz, there's this real appreciation or again gravitation towards it seems to me towards fusion, towards progressive kind of complex, sophisticated types of music rather than you know the classic rock of Nickelback or something you know um, mm -hmm. uh, what what is that and is, is that does that partly come from um, the legacy of a, of a group like Pink Floyd not just Pink Floyd Santana Richie Blackmore Deep Purple Led Zeppelin and even the Beatles my friend what we've got to bear in mind is the children of today they are the students of the kids who were brought up on this music. So when, as a young musician today, I speak to him, the young people like Puya Mahmoud, who's a brilliant musician, and he says to me, Arash Mitui Roya, that's who you need to look up. Arash Mitui uses the influences of these important musicians, and the people who then follow him are clearly impacted by this. If that makes, if that sort of answers your it, question. It does, and you're not the first one to mention Arash Mitui. In fact, yes, we've got him yes. coming up on part four of this series. Um, what a pleasure. Thank you for this. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I want you to come on to tell the, to, so we can do an interview about the life story, the incredible work of Roy Arab as well. But but um, on Pink Floyd, this has been a, such a pleasure. Merci and thank you. خیلی من از شما خیلی فارسی با نمکه فارسی من لچه خیلی خوبی دارم هیچ چی نمی فهمم ولی می تونم well it's a delight to meet you with your dodgy Iranian accent love thank you talk to you soon and خدا all the best my love bye bye to call out would you touch me hey you would you help me to carry the stone open your heart I'm coming home
This is full time for part one of our special series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. This part was dealing with fandom and context. Part two, we address Sonic's class and connection. Remember, you can find all four parts of this series at our website, rookmedia.com, where you can also find our other episodes. Subscribe and become a patron to support. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you for sharing our content. And thank you to the whole Rook team for working on this. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Mizumbashi. Mizumbashi.